ちゃんちゃんとにあんたこの子。なの Good afternoon. I propose we get slowly started. Uh, 
to this meeting on cybersecurity, digital governance, and the search for technological leadership. These are big themes uh, which our group here led by Lorenzo Popillo and Andrea Renda are uh, trying to elucidate today with the, hope of, with the help of two panels. And uh, you will see that I have two empty chairs uh, to my right. That is because these people are on different continents. I hope they're already remotely connected. And uh, I propose that we give them uh, the floor, so to speak, first. Let me just make a few housekeeping announcements, which is that this meeting is on the record. It's actually going to be web streamed. Um, and uh, the second point is that uh, we would like to have first the four participants of the panel, keeping themselves to 12, maximum 15 minutes. And then I hope we have a uh, lively interaction uh, with, the, with the audience. I myself, I'm not an expert in these, uh, in these issues. All I can say is that uh, I have a certain uh, feeling of deja vu all over again. As somebody who came uh, to uh, Brussels and Europe in the 80s and 90s, when we were talking about the newly industrialized countries, uh, Japan and, and other East Asian tigers, who are going to take away all of our industries and high tech, and Jacques has actually some examples in his uh, presentation. His memory goes back even further. And the two questions at the time were always, I think, and the same as we are putting today. Uh, the first one is, should we be worried if somebody takes over an industry? And usually the answer is only if they are specific economies of scale. So that it matters that somebody else does certain stuff instead of us. And the certain key question also from the past which remains is, is a state or maybe a party better positioned to identify these future sectors of external economies of scale which uh, promise to yield particularly rich productivity gains? And uh, that's a question uh, which then was difficult to answer and I think it will remain also difficult to answer today, but I wanted my speakers to, uh, to keep these two questions in mind. And now, without further ado, I presume you have seen uh, the line of speakers, so, so I will not introduce them uh, any further. We have Paul Triolo from Geotechnology. Uh, he is also with the Europe Asia Group, but is neither in Asia, as far as I know, nor in Europe, but in the US. Uh, Paul, are you connected? I am connected. Can you hear me? Great. We can hear you very well. And I would like you now Good. to start with your presentation. Thank you, Daniel. So very, a great pleasure to be here. Um, I am not in Europe or Asia, but I have just been to Europe and Asia talking about all these issues. Um, and so what I thought I would do was give you a sense uh, of, of sort of how we at Eurasia Group here are looking at this, this broader problem. Um, we're, a, we're a geopolitical risk consultancy, and so we have clients on all sides of this issue. We have, you know, we deal with carriers and equipment vendors and, um, and computer makers, and so we're very much um, AI companies. We're very much um, part of, the, of, of the, the ongoing debate here uh, and all the questions that are, that are, that are part of this, of this panel. So, um, let me just start with with the way we sort of look at the, at the U.S.-China relationship, and then I'll, I'll also deal. I'll bring in Europe also, because of course Europe is a, big, is a big part of this. But we we've obviously been steeped in the last year and a half in this U.S.-China trade uh, conflict, which I think um, we were early on identified as really much more than a, than a trade uh, conflict, and really really about technology and about technology leadership uh, globally uh, and in key key areas like 5G, uh, et cetera, AI. So when we look at this issue uh, of U.S.-China and how this fits into the broader picture, we look at basically three major baskets of issues that relate to technology and technology leadership. And so um, the first one is really the sort of 
specifically trade related issues. Um, if some of these have been around for a long time, things like subsidies uh, that China provides to its to its leading technology industries, things like Made in China 2025, which has become a big issue both in the United States and in Europe, of course, over the last two years. Um, these are leading industries like semiconductors, um, new energy vehicles, uh, telecommunications equipment, et cetera, artificial intelligence. So the trade related issues right now are sort of front and center in the relationship. So subsidies is a big issue. There's the issue of forced technology transfer in the sense that China has been forcing U.S. and European companies to, to transfer technology under under less than market conditions. Uh, that's a big subject of the, of, the, of the trade negotiations right now that we're in the middle of. And then, of course, the cyber theft of IP, or intellectual property. Um, this is something that's been, again, a longstanding issue in the United States, concern that China has been using uh, cyber means to obtain technology, and also, of course, from your European companies, as we saw over the last few months with some uh, some major indictments brought against Chinese actors for um, activity in Europe and in the United States. But I think one of the big issues that we're looking at, uh, and, and it's become a big sticking point in the negotiations, is market access for U.S. technology companies. And then, of course, by extension, European companies would be would benefit if there's a deal. And this is interesting because it re revolves around right now, one of the big issues is uh, access to cloud services. And so, for example, China has limited um, the ability of major U.S. companies to participate in cloud. And that's, again, sort of viewed as a, the future of technology, one of the biggest big areas where um, U.S. companies have been pretty dominant. Uh, China has been able to keep that market closed uh, while it nurtures its national champions like Alibaba and Tencent, for example, and Baidu. And so the U.S. is really pushing on this. But it becomes a very complicated issue because, because now we're in the, the era of data and data governance. And I think this is one of the questions that was that was um, that, that uh, we're, we're trying to address here. And I think what's, what's happened is, for example, that the, that the issue of cloud services has quickly become morphed into this broader difficulty with U.S. and China and Europe and globally about how China does data governance. And so, for example, um, China is sort of an outlier right now. Uh, it's not going to be deemed adequate under the general data protection regulation in Europe. Uh, it's not a member of the CPTPP, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which has very uh, strict uh, guidelines, for example, around uh, data, data governance and digital governance. Uh, and, it's, and it hasn't joined the, the, uh, the APEC uh, cross-border privacy rules. And so China is a big outlier on this. And so this issue is coming up now in the trade negotiations, but it's turning out to be a really complicated issue because um, it, there's just so many aspects to it. There's an international aspect to it. And I think the trade negotiators aren't necessarily the right people to deal with this broader issue of data governance. So, so that, that's one basket of, I think, of, of trade-related issues that, and technology issues that are really important that we watch very carefully, which impact on all the things we'll be discussing today. And then the second basket, I think, has, has become much more important just over the last two years. And I, I call this broadly technology control. So for example, in the United States, over the past two years, there's a perception that China, again, in particular, has been exploiting uh, access to US technology, to acquire uh, companies and access to leading edge um, firms. Uh, Europe, of course, uh, is also involved in this uh, with the acquisition in 2016 of, of KUKA, the Germans, uh, Germany's leading robotics company. So over the last two years, two, two and three years, um, this issue of, of Chinese investment and how this is handled with particularly sensitive sectors like um, automation, robotics, artificial intelligence, semiconductors, has come to the fore. So last year, the U.S. updated its, um, its le the legal underpinnings of, uh, of the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S., which reviews investments. Uh, this is a big change in the U.S. Uh, Europe, of course, now has followed earlier this year with a, uh, an investment mechanism for information sharing at the, at the commission level. Um, so this, this sort of sense that, that, they, that, that, that the, the West, if you will, Europe and the U.S. has to be careful how it allows Chinese investment has become a really huge issue. And then the corollary to that also is export controls. The U.S. is, is in the process right now of beefing up export controls uh, with the new Export Control Reform Act last year, uh, and they're considering, uh, the U.S. Commerce Department is considering new controls over things like artificial intelligence, quantum computing, again, these areas where, um, where there's a, per a perception that we're that we're in a race with China uh, in some of these technologies. And then the, the final part of that is the supply chain piece. And that's where I would, I would squarely put 
uh, issues like 5G, next generation mobile, mobile uh, networks. Um, the U.S. is very concerned about the concentration of supply chains, particularly ICT supply chains, information and communications technology supply chains in China. Uh, and so there's a big effort uh, in the U.S. to figure out how to secure supply chains. Um, part of the trade the trade uh, issue is, is uh, in fact, the tariffs are designed to force U.S. companies to move some of these supply chains out of China. So we're in this process right now of uh, what some people are calling decoupling uh, of these global supply chains. And then, of course, 5G falls in the middle of this whole issue. Uh, the U.S. has long been concerned about China and companies like Huawei and PPE and their uh, dominance or, or primary role in, in uh, mobile, mobile telecommunications and, and, and now 5G. So that issue now is obviously before, of course, in Europe, there's a lot of concern about this. We can talk about this further. Uh, we did a white paper last year in November called The Geopolitics of 5G. Uh, if you just Google geopolitics to 5G, pull it up. But we look at all the issues related to 5G, um, from spectrum to uh, to standards, and, to, and then to sort of equipment you know, manufacturing. And that's that's really looking out 10 years. That's really one of the big areas we see for for struggle and for uh, you know, for dominance. I think again, there'll probably be many winners. But uh, this is an area the U.S. in particular is very focused on. Um, there was a conference about a week ago in Prague looking at 5G supply chain security which have tried to address some of these issues around, um, you know, who's manufacturing the equipment and where it's being manufactured and what the, what the nature of the political regime is, where the, where the equipment's being manufactured. So that's a really big issue. And then that final basket of those three baskets, so there's the trade issues, the technology control issues, and then the sort of the sense that the, that the U.S. and China in particular, and Europe to some degree too, are, we're in this struggle for dominance of the technologies of the future. And this is specifically artificial intelligence uh, and quantum computing. Uh, I would also probably throw in 5G here because really 5G is it's 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 we're on the verge of deploying large 5G networks, but the future is still it's still sometime in the future. It's really a 10 year a 10 year process, um, and so you know this is this has come out again uh, in China uh, out of things like the the publishing of a national plan for artificial intelligence in 2017 that called for China to basically dominate or be a dominant player. Uh, in artificial intelligence by 2030, this set up a lot of alarm bells uh, in the U.S. about, you know, does the U.S. have a strategy for AI? Europe, I think, is, uh, also has been concerned about this, and does, does Europe have a strategy for AI? Um, so a lot of the, a lot of the, um, the, the sort of longer-term issues aren't going to go away, for example, even if uh, there is some resolution uh, of some of the issues around the trade uh, and technology aspects that I mentioned earlier. These, these issues around technology control, supply chain, and around the sense that we're in this long-term struggle over who's going to uh, dominate uh, in some of these technologies of the future, you know, these are not going to go away. Now, I would argue, I've tried to argue that it's, I, I don't see this as a zero-sum game necessarily, that you know, one side wins uh, and the other side loses. I think um, particularly for something like artificial intelligence, it's not really a technology that, that, that in the same way that, uh, let's say, semiconductor uh, manufacturing is. Um, and so there are going to be a lot of winners on the AI and the AI because it's really a, an enabling technology that will enable a lot of other applications and is part of a broader system of systems, uh, for example, autonomous vehicles, uh, smart cities, and that kind of thing. So I think we, the one, one of the things we want to try to avoid is, is being locked into this idea that, that China's gain is somehow you know, a loss uh, to, to the U.S. or to Europe, I think. Uh, if you look specifically at AI, which I've done a fairly uh, in-depth look at, at the China cooperation with the U.S. and AI, there's a tremendous amount of cooperation in that sector. For example, a lot of researchers are collaborating, um, and so it's really it's really tough to see this as, as, a, as a zero-sum game if you if you look at it fairly hard. So um, 5G is a little different, I think, because um, there there is this sense that there's going to be two supply chains one centered on China and one centered on the U.S. And then, then there is the sense of a race to see who can deploy, for example, 5G at some kind of a scale and so that you can get innovation on top of 5G. Because that's really the, the real issue around 5G is, 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 is the, the fact that it's going to enable all of these um, new uh, and, and advanced uh, applications like smart cities, autonomous uh, vehicles, uh, remote surgery, and those kind of things. So, again, I think that, that, that the, the meme has become you know, that, that there is this contest where there, if you take any of these technologies, somebody's going to get ahead and somebody's going to fall behind. Um, I think it's a little more complicated than that, a little more nuanced than that. 
And so we at Eurasia Group have tried to tried to help uh, our clients work through some of these issues and understand, you know, how this is evolving. I think the overarching, I'll, I'll just close on, I think the really key issue that a lot of people have not focused on um, and that we're doing a lot of work on is this issue of data and data governance, because all of these technologies involve data, right? 5G is going to enable this huge amount of data to be flowing around, um, a lot of infrastructure data, a lot of sensitive data, a lot of personal data. Um, AI is going to be all about leveraging large data sets um, and, and training algorithms. And so the issue of data governance and how the, how the, the globe, um, how internationally there, we, we get to some level of interoperability uh, and we get, sorry, we get security over data, we get data privacy, uh, you know, what are the best practices? This is really going to be the key issue going forward. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, China is remaining sort of an outlier on this, but it's company uh, like Alibaba, the big players want to operate globally. They're already operating in Europe. Um, you know, uh, WeChat, hey, I, I was in uh, Amsterdam Airport last week, and uh, I saw a lot of signs for, um, for 10 cents WeChat pay. Uh, and I know, that, of course, that Alibaba is, has, has lots of data centers in Europe. And so those companies are going to want to operate uh, globally. They're going to want to uh, adhere to things like GDPR, at least when they're operating in Europe, comply. So the big issue, I think, going forward is going to be how uh, how we resolve uh, these issues around data and data governance between the very different legal systems that are out there. Um, the U.S. And, and, and the EU have been able to find ways uh, for interoperability to things like the privacy shield. Um, I think Asia and China in particular are, are really now going to be um, in, the, in the crosshairs here going forward about how we get to some agreement on on, on data, cross-border data flows. And then the, the other piece will be some, will be some agreement on around artificial intelligence, around ethics, um, and around um, norms. And I think one thing we want to try to avoid is having China be oh, can I interrupt uh, you, the odd man out on that. Mm-hmm. Can I interrupt yeah, you? Um, mm-hmm. Thanks a lot. So if I understand you correctly, you are saying that the uh, trade war between the U.S. and China is really about technological dominance. But if I heard you correctly, you said that it's not necessarily a zero-sum game, um, that uh, yeah. China wins and the U.S. And of course, there's the particular importance of data. Let's come back to that later. Let yeah. me just make one further housekeeping sure. announcement. For the people who are in the back of the room, the fire mm-hmm. police always uh, dislikes people uh, standing in the exit. And therefore, I would encourage you to take some of the seats which are still available here in front. I know you don't want to uh, disturb people, but uh, as I said, for our security uh, feelings, uh, it helps us a lot if uh, there are as few people as possible standing in the back. Sorry, this was just a housekeeping announcement uh, um, and uh, as I announced earlier, then I would like to uh, turn to Cecilia. Are you online? Cecilia, can you hear me? That's hello? Oh, uh, uh, hello, everybody. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. And I want in particular to take up this point uh, about... Uh, do we care about uh, China or somebody else dominating a technology? Uh, at least from an economic point of view, uh, what are the areas where we should really be concerned? And I see that okay, so the, the a, just a second, you have a presentation which is coming on screen slowly. Yes. And uh, it is entitled The Relevance of Intangible Investments in the Digital Age. Is that correct? Yes, correct. Okay. Why don't you go? Okay, so thank you for having me. And uh, uh, well, I'm really, you know, trying to uh, look at these issues from uh, a little bit different uh, perspective from what has been done in the previous uh, intervention. And uh, the idea is, uh, uh, and I have to tell you, I'm sorry for not having the possibility of showing nothing about China, but this is a data issue, really. So we do not still have enough information about uh, intangible assets uh, in uh, the Chinese economy. But the idea of uh, my brief intervention is just to, you know, be focused on uh, what in principle should be necessary for, uh, you know, the leading economies to um, really, you know, take uh, 
um, the governance of uh, uh, the, um, the global digital transformation, which I think is, uh, you know, a key issue in the debate also between the US and China. So the only, uh, you know, uh, really uh, trade uh, uh, evidence, uh, the, the evidence that I will show you will be, you know, uh, mostly focused on uh, the global value chain uh, type of relationship that they do have. But let me go first on, you know, what is uh, uh, the main uh, issue here. Uh, in principle, and uh, in, according to this, there has been, you know, a lot of empirical evidence as well has a lot of uh, papers uh, looking at, you know, what do you really need in order to, you know, uh, gain the benefits of the digitalization that can be, as you were saying at the very beginning, uh, uh, in terms of boosting productivity growth, or also in, you know, being able of uh, taking uh, uh, the leadership in, uh, in the global economy. Essentially, what uh, the modern economies are experiencing nowadays is, you know, a deep transformation that enti is entirely related to, you know, the advancement in the, the technological, uh, uh, technological advancement and uh, so artificial intelligence and so all the digitalization related issues. And... Uh, you know, this transformation entails that in order to benefit from uh, uh, this transformation and to be to gain, uh, you know, a leading uh, uh, position, it is necessary to look at also at some other complementary type of activities and assets. And one of the uh, main uh, uh, main is related to the capability of you know abandoning the old business models and adopt new ones. That for uh, you know uh, most of most of them are entirely based on uh, uh, you know uh, intangible assets, and in in this respect there has been, uh, as I said, some uh, uh, evidence uh, where the idea is that we are not really uh, yet uh, you know uh, seeing the the benefits from the digitalization. Uh, because in order to see them, uh, we need first to invest in intangible assets. So let me very quickly uh, introduce uh, uh, to, to what I mean when I refer to the intangible assets. And then uh, I'm going to try to you know, link uh, to uh, the debate that is going on uh, in, in that is going on between the US and China. So the idea is that uh, if we start looking differently at uh, you know, what are the main drivers of growth and what are the main uh, type of investment expenditures that would allow, you know, uh, us, first of all, to better understand the transformation that is going on uh, in uh, the global economy and uh, also to understand better. The need. We need to essentially... Uh, and to start looking at additional assets that have been not uh, included until now uh, in, uh, uh, in the national accounts, for example. And these are essentially uh, shown in this table where you can uh, see that there are the traditional tangible investment, as we know, uh, in, uh, uh, from the national accounts. And then there is, uh, on uh, the right -hand side column, the intangible investments. Some of them are already treated as investment in GDP, while others are not. And in particular, I really would like you to focus on uh, the last part, uh, uh, the, the last rows in this, in this table, where uh, uh, essentially we have, uh, besides R&D, uh, the economic competencies, and meaning uh, three different type of assets. One is training, the other one is the activity of market research and branding, and the other is business process reengineering. And this is exactly what... Uh, 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 seems to be the most important intangible assets when uh, uh, we want to uh, start thinking about how to benefit and how to, you know, uh, uh, gain the position, a leading position uh, in, uh, in the digital economy. The reason why uh, uh, this is relevant is uh, because this is at the basis of the possibility of changing, uh, uh, of adopting new business models. And... Uh, you know, what the, one of the most uh, relevant characteristics of this type of investment that, as I said, are not yet considered as investment in national accounts, but there is a, a plenty of, uh, you know, uh, empirical study doing this, so treating them as investment, is because if we do this exercise and uh, for a second we look at the trend of uh, 
over time of tangible and intangible investment as has been represented in, in the table. And you look at this chart where essentially you have the dynamic of the uh, intangible share of a GDP for the US and Europe as a whole. You can immediately uh, observe that the intangible shares that are represented by the blue dotted lines, while the tangibles is uh, the, the red dotted one, um, in the US, there ha ha something happened uh, uh, very differently compared to the EU, and it is essentially related to the idea that the intangibles outpace the tangibles. While in Europe, we cannot really uh, observe the same trend, even if we are uh, observing that there is an increasing uh, uh, intangible share as well. So if we want to get more sense of, about the relevance of these assets, and uh, uh, we might just calculate their uh, uh, GDP shares. And in the next chart, okay, uh, where you have the tangible and the in, that are represented by the blue bars and the intangible by the red bars. Uh, this is an average over a long period of time, which is 1999-2016. You can see immediately that uh, we have uh, a group of countries, namely France, UK, Finland, US, and Sweden, where intangibles are outpacing tangibles. And interesting, uh, this evidence is interesting because uh, going to the idea of having an idea about you know, the relationship between the intangible intensity and the digital intensity, if we then move to the uh, following slide, Sorry, can okay, uh, and uh, we look at the uh, digital intensity that is essentially uh, the value added share of uh, uh, the digital sectors. This uh, uh, you know uh, uh, refers to uh, an OECD classification uh, for the digital intensity. Uh, we can observe, and in the table you can see that we have three different groups essentially of sectors in the countries that have been represented in the previous chart, where we have HD, which refers to the high digital intensive, then we have the medium, and then we have the low digital intensive. Now, the, it is interesting to notice that uh, if you, for example, focus for a second on the US, but this is true also for the UK, and as well as for France, we have over time, so before the financial crisis and after the financial crisis, excluding the financial crisis years, uh, that there is an increasing uh, relevance of the high digital intensive sectors while both the medium and the low digital intensive uh, decrease uh, uh, their relevance over time. Now, the reason why uh, this is interesting is because even if we are at the very beginning in this literature, the idea is that uh, in order to gain the benefits from the digitalization, as we said from the very beginning, you need to invest in intangible assets. And as you can see, you know, the most advanced uh, economies uh, uh, in, in terms of, uh, especially in, in digital terms, if you, if you let me use this, uh, uh, this expression are also the same that are the more intensive uh, in terms of uh, um, intangible assets. So the idea underlying, you know, these two charts uh, is uh, that there is a strong complementarity between uh, between them. If we then move to trade, uh, and this is one of uh, my last uh, um, slides, you can see uh, that if we do an additional exercise and we move for a second uh, to the global value chain that essentially you know most of uh, trade flows today nearly the 70 percent of course inside a global value chain so it makes sense to start looking uh, uh, at trade in, in inside you know the global value chain and in other words try to gather what is the, the relevance of uh, uh, global value chain participation uh, for, uh, for these countries. Uh, and uh, uh, we can do this exercise, uh, you know, di distinguishing uh, uh, the different extent of uh, um, digitalization of uh, uh, the, the economies. And uh, in this chart, what uh, um, it is shown is a very simple correlation 
between uh, labor productivity growth and uh, different mode of participation in global value chain. Now, if you, and essentially here, um, uh, we represent just the low digital intensive and the high digital intensive. But there is one main message here that uh, I would like to emphasize. The idea is that if you look at the high digital, um, and here the representation is, you know, the blue dots refers to the period before the financial crisis, while the red dots are referred to the period after the financial crisis. Crisis. So the idea is that at the end of the day, uh, if you look at the high digital sectors, it seems that they uh, essentially were in the position of uh, absorbing better compared to the low digital sectors, you know, the shock that uh, they experienced with the financial crisis and the recovery as well. Now, if we put together, uh, you know, these few uh, uh, results that I have uh, shown to you, um, it emerged, I think, uh, uh, something that might be interesting for the debate in terms of trying to better understand uh, essentially what is necessary to really, you know, uh, 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 take the lead in the global digital uh, uh, economy. Uh, and of course, it would be very nice to have, you know, uh, to in include China in uh, uh, the, the charts that I have shown, but I, I hope that it will be possible in, in the near future. But anyway, this already gives you an idea of uh, uh, where we are. So the idea is that, you know, uh, the uh, intangible investment essentially, and in particular, the skills and the training type of investment are uh, an essential element to uh, enable the digital transformation. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, also uh, the idea of having the possibility of uh, um, uh, guarantee a better knowledge diffusion, that is another key aspect of uh, uh, the digital transformation. And then the idea is that so this type of investment, this type of assets are really what is necessary in order to be able then to deal with the new business models that are emerging in uh, the global digital economy. Um, that essentially uh, it might require, as uh, was mentioned before, a new regulatory approach in many different areas uh, as well. Um, so, in other words, uh, uh, you know, the, the main message from uh, uh, all, uh, uh, you know, the, these results that I have shown is, is that in order to, you know, uh, try to understand also the escalation of, uh, you know, uh, the trade relationship between uh, war, trade, trade between uh, the US and China, uh, we might probably need to uh, look deeper at what are their, uh, you know, uh, um, not only the technological endowments, but also, you know, the capabilities that both of them have uh, uh, to uh, really gain, you know, uh, gain from the digitalization and what position they um, uh, can have uh, in terms of, you know, what is the intangible endowments that seems to be one of the key variables in order to then you know benefit from uh, the ongoing digitalization I'm thank sure. you Thanks, yeah. okay now i think we're turning finally to the elephant in the room <laughs> uh, that is china <laughs> who else and uh, we're very proud to <coughs> welcome jan weidenfeld from the mercato institute for china studies I presume your contribution will be more focused on this particular country. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me, certainly. Um, and well, maybe let me start with a caveat. So I'm not a tech guy, nor am I an, an economist. I'm just a China watcher, you know, a political analyst. But I'll, tr I'll try my best to enlighten you a little bit. And basically, I also don't have slides because I have a very simple message for you today. And that message is basically that we will face systemic rivalry with China in the space of uh, digital policy um, and digital economy. Now, this is hardly surprising. You probably saw there was a commission communication in March using exactly that label, systemic rival, not so much with regard to digital issues. But I mean, the underlying notion there is basically we have seen China going in a certain direction, one where 
the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, is again expanding its reach into society, <coughs> into the economy, where a lot of the market-oriented reforms we had seen over the last decades are actually being rolled back. So some halted, some being rolled back. And if we take that as a starting point and then look at the digital race, I think, you know, then we can only conclude that we'll be ending up in a sort of systemic rivalry situation um, also here in Europe. And actually, I will touch upon some of the issues Paul has been mentioning, um, and I think that that is also no surprise because indeed, in terms of how we assess China, specifically also in this space, we are more aligned with the US, I would say, than we would sometimes, um, well, admit perhaps publicly. So that rivalry I was talking about has an economic component, it has a privacy and security component quite clearly, but indeed it also has a global governance component. So let's, let's look at the economic picture first. And if you've been following, well, major European newspapers in recent months, well, perhaps over the last 12 months, I'd say, you know, it was pretty much doom and gloom, right? When we look at technology and China, it was all like, okay, basically we are done. Look at what the Chinese are doing, you know, it's basically over for us. We, we won't be able to compete in a lot of the critical domains like quantum, like AI, like 5G, like blockchain technology. And I think that, image is right to a certain extent, whoops, never mind, that that image is right to a certain extent, but it's, it's not, the way it's portrayed, it's, it's, that, that is not the right sort of um, um, starting point to my mind. So yes, of course, you know, look at quantum computing. That's a domain where China uh, arguably is the most advanced in terms of the new emerging technologies, and certainly very much so compared to, to Europe. Um, I mean, there's lots of experts out there saying here is actually China is leading globally, you know. Um, it has put as, uh, 10 times as much money into R&D as the U.S., you know. Conservative estimates are around 50 billion U.S. dollars over the past five years. It has uh, twice as many patents as the U.S. on an annual basis registered, at least that's what we had in 2018. And it is relatively self-reliant. That's a critical point, and I'll come to that back in a moment. So all the core technologies it needs in that domain, it actually has in stock. That's quite important. Blockchain technology. When you talk to international executives, tech executives, um, and indeed there was a survey on this recently, so we also have it on paper, you know, they will tell you China is going in the lead there very, very clearly. It might not yet be but it's really on, on path to, to leadership in that particular field. Um, and again, um, when you look at patents, China is already leading. Now, that doesn't say much about quality. It's a quantitative assessment, obviously, but it's already leading there. In investment, we also are at a tipping point where it's neck to neck with the US. And most importantly, what we're seeing with blockchain technology, we see it deployed on a large scale. Um, for instance, in Guangdong province, where it's basically the, the local administration IT systems are now run on blockchain technology. So this is administering 1.3 million people. You know, we haven't had anything similar in the US or Europe so far, and I don't think we'll have any time soon, quite frankly. But then the picture is really more nuanced when we look at some of the other issues we've been hearing about more, more lately, artificial intelligence and 5G. So, again, when you look at sort of quantifiable rankings, again, AI, China is super impressive, you know. Most funding secured, most patents in recent years, highest uh, amount of R&D investment, you know, by all sorts of metrics. You know, just to give you one example, so we have that commission plan, obviously 2.6 billion euro investment into um, AI research, you know, and there's, there's an AI research park outside Beijing where they've just invested 2.1 billion euros in just one research park, and there's plenty of those out there in China. So that gives you a sense for the dimension what, when we're comparing. But China has a massive shortage uh, in terms of talent, and it really shows. They could be much more ahead if they had that talent, and indeed they're working very closely in that field in, uh, with, with European research institutes, for instance, U.S. research institutes to, well, also, of course, but that's more tricky now. Um, so, but talent is a real problem, um, and that, in turn, is a problem for us because we see massive brain drain now happening. European research is going to China just because the conditions are much more, uh, much more favorable. Um, don't need to talk about regulatory environment in terms of data privacy and so on. Um, that's a major issue here. Um, and then 5G. I mean, 
that has really been one of the key issues uh, in recent months, and we'll be hearing more about that later today, so I don't want to talk too much about it. But even with 5G, ever since um, that, well, tech war with the U.S. started and the U.S. reached out to countries, you know, cautioning them, I think also European countries, quite frankly, even without U.S., uh, uh, nudging, you know, doing their own assessments of the upsides and downsides of having Huawei uh, heavily invested in the rollout of 5G. We have actually seen the numbers of 5G in terms of distribution going down uh, in terms of rollout. So currently, uh, I mean, it's always a, a bit of a nectar race with Ericsson globally, but Ericsson is a little bit up again in terms of overall distribution of network infrastructure, mobile network infrastructure. Um, and so China has, or Huawei, I should say, has taken a bit of a hit there. So, this is basically when we look at some of the issue areas where we currently stand. But I think we are in for a much more fundamental challenge, and this is really about the future, and that has a lot to do with the economic system in China, really. And Jack will also be talking a little bit about that, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep this short. So, what's very clear, and we see that very strongly here in Europe, the Chinese tech economy is thriving on a tilted level playing field. So, what do I mean by that? Look at the bad companies, so um, basically um, Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, uh, or the other way around, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. So those companies are major players now, certainly in China, in their respective fields, also increasingly globally, uh, especially in South-South Corporation. But, you know, they have been thriving really on, on state funding and massive protective measures. Um, and so... Basically, you know, there's no level playing field when it comes to European competitors um, uh, competing against those, certainly not on the Chinese market. And everything we are seeing there currently in terms of market access barriers, post-market access barriers, actually, um, we, we don't see a landslide change. You know, we've just had a, no a new foreign investment law. Basically, when you look at it, it's in a way even more restrictive than we had in the past because they've now included the uh, component of economic competition in terms of deciding who can invest and who can't. And especially in the ICT sector, basically, we see massive restrictions. Basically, this is a shut-off market. So, um, so you have a really nice ecosystem for, this com for those companies in terms of domestic competition. At the same time, and that was already mentioned, you have a very targeted outbound in f um, uh, foreign direct investment policy uh, where you, technologies are basically being bought, uh, also to the benefit of those companies. You have state-orchestrated R&D collaboration ventures. So, for instance, the other day, um, well, obviously I'm coming from Berlin, so the other day somebody told me that there had been a Chinese delegation to a technical university University in Germany. Uh, CCP-led delegation, you know, different ministries involved, other universities involved, and they didn't quite know what they actually wanted. But at the end of the tour basically said, well, and obviously they looked primarily at STEM research at that institution, Technical University once again. At the end of that tour they basically said, well, this is all very nice. Actually, we would like to give, to give you 250, Euro, uh, 250 million um, euros, uh, basically to invest uh, and to partner up in terms of research. Um, and, yeah, well, that, that is potentially a great thing. Um, but I think, you know, the university basically was like, well, what is this? Where is this coming from? What is the agenda? And this is a bit of a problem, really, that we are basically struggling there to make sense. And clearly, again, of course, the, the technologies that I've been looking at were basically, uh, well, um, let's say, uh, uh, firmly within the realm of Made in China 2025 and so Chinese industrial policy. So no big surprises here. So... <sighs> Basically, the other thing, of course, very clear, you have a very ambitious state-led agenda. Um, you have several small leading groups. Uh, sure. Well, this is, this is basically what I would say is, yes, absolutely take the money, but make it bulletproof in terms of, of the arrangements of research collaboration and do a proper evaluation of what it is you're sharing and what the implications of that might be. I think we have been way too naive about this generally and also quite frankly I think many universities in Europe are not up to the challenge. They're not in a position to actually do that proper evaluation of what it means to, to, to collaborate and what that might also mean in, in terms of um, indeed technological competitiveness of host country of the European economy. So I'd be, I'd be way more restrictive um, there, quite frankly. Um, but I know um, you will hear different voices, obviously, on, on this particular point. Um, 
so uh, let me let me just uh, expedite this a bit so um, that I don't s steal all of Jack's uh, thunder there. I, th I think the, um, the the important thing then is also that there is a clear state-led agenda. So you have really Xi Jinping and his top brass involved on a daily basis through small leading groups, central commissions, and so on in the steering of this project of well, digital rejuvenation, as they would call it, you know? So basically, a lot of steer there, policy steer, combined with heavy state fund investments. Um, and by the way, also a lot of Chinese state-owned venture capital now uh, being active, which is actually quite, quite effective. You have a helpful, highly helpful regulatory environment, of course, when it comes to data privacy. So especially when we look at beta-driven applications and so on, that's for sure. Um, the Chinese are really investing a lot in talent education and attraction um, because they're lacking their talents, specifically in the field of AI, which is uh, quite key. You see a lot of R&D promotion and funding by the state, huge amounts. I mentioned some of them earlier on. And they're also learning from past mistakes. I mean, we still, you know, planned economy have all these notions about there being inefficiency, gross misallocation, and so on. They've really found ways, um, you know, to disperse certain core interests across different regions in a, in, in a relatively efficient manner that you don't have too much duplication. And all of this will, frankly, to my mind, be, well, um, further accelerated by the doubling down on self-reliance that the Chinese are now seeking. When last November, basically, SETI almost went bust because they couldn't get a hand on Chinese semiconductors, that was really a wake-up call that they have to be more self-reliant. I mean, we, have, we had seen it with industrial targets over the past two years anyway, that sort of, um, well, goal um, of being mostly autark when it comes to these emerging technologies, but now I think there's an additional um, really, really uh, impetus to, to make that happen. And that brings me actually to the security dimension, and this will be much shorter, so don't worry, I'll, I'll be wrapping up in a moment. So, basically, we're very much preoccupied currently in our debates with Chinese technology entering Europe, right? 5G being sort of the epitome of that discussion, if you want so. But I think we might see in the, we might also need to brace in the future for a scenario where we see a ZTE case reverse, so to say, where actually ch it is China withholding critical technology that we need in Europe. And I think that is something we really need to brace for. Um, and so basically, uh, um, there it's, it's, it's really important that we do proper risk analysis with regard to our supply chains. And I mean, that's one of the points Paul also made very strongly about the concentration of supply chains. But it's really, with the Chinese, I think we need to expect at some point withholding technology if it uh, suits, uh, um, well, strategic purposes. And frankly, I mean, the Americans have given sort of a precedence there, so it's, it's, it's only a small step in a way if you want so. Um, and then I think privacy as a last point should m move much more into the focus. Um, because we have been talking a lot about the security implications, again, of 5G uh, in particular, and in general, investment in critical infrastructure. Um, there's whole new challenges. Smart cities concept was already mentioned, so basically China rolling out um, facial recognition also in European cities eventually, at least that's the plan. Um, and cities gladly taking that up to counter crime. Um, we have the issue of fintech apps, uh, social media apps coming to Europe in the future. So WeChat obviously being the most um, popular brand there, where we have all sorts of data privacy issues we need to tackle. That's really a big governance challenge. Um, and of course, we have in general very, very different visions of, of what um, data governance should be about. You've probably heard about the social credit system in China. You might have heard about how ethnic minorities are being treated in Xinjiang, for instance. Um, total IT-backed surveillance 24 hours a day. I think these are issues we should probably also discuss. And then that's also probably a good pretext to discuss more sort of global governance issues, because indeed China has a very distinct vision and agenda there. As you illustrated, uh, when one talks about China, uh, everything comes on the plate. But let's try to keep it a little bit in the cybersecurity digital um, uh, domain. And I think uh, now we turn to uh, the question which is more close, which is closer to home, namely, what can or should uh, Europe do? And uh, we're all expecting a clear answer from Jacques. Thank you. Um, do you move the slide? Okay, I'll, I have 
I, I like an octopus. <laughs> Does it work? Less than that. Maybe you do it. I'll wait. <laughs> so I was asked to uh, look a bit at what is in the title. And clearly that's already very difficult to comprehend in the first place, let alone to talk effectively in 12 minutes about this conundrum because it's so incredibly complicated. Um, and if you focus on only one or two or three high-tech forms, it becomes a little bit more simple, but that's actually both, it, 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 it gives more focus, but it also leaves, a lot, leaves out a lot, so it's very, very problematic. Um, so this is what I hope to deal with. Next one. So even when we push away in the first three bullet points some big issues, uh, the policy conundrum is still extremely complicated. And it begins, I will not speak about that now, I have actually written an article on what does it really mean, the socialist market economy's Chinese characteristic as a, as a, as a systemic trade issue, because that's what it is. It is more than that, but if you take it as a, as a, it is a number of layers of control, and Jan already alluded to a few. Um, we have long been either sleeping or n turning a blind eye, um, and also I did it until you truly begin to realize what's going on there. And um, that has its implications almost everywhere. And there is no time now to discuss that in, in, in great detail. But Jan's two sentences are already alarming enough, I think. I think you can argue also that inside China this is controversial. Um, and all the way to the top of the elite. And I now and then come in China and I'm not hindered by it so much as I'm in Norwich, that's not my neighbor. Um, and Daniel and I will in two weeks will be there again in, in Fudan University. But um, these people, when they are private, they complain bitterly about this uh, and about the bureaucracy, the, the totality of controls, uh, the irrelevance of merit, uh, you name it. I mean, it's and the last conference I was in Beijing was opened by the Communist Party, representative of the university. I was pretty shocked, I must say. Um, so it's everywhere. So uh, I think it's important to keep that in mind. So there are specific issues, but there is this wider layer or fog or overlay. Um, also, um, and that's consistent, as Jan has said, and some others, is that it, it's, there's a huge domestic market which China has learned to exploit. So when it does something with abroad, whether it's restricting access in trade and investment, or whether it is going out to the abroad, it's very much focused, first of all, on exploiting the huge domestic market. I'll give you one example. Um, Syngenta was taken over for $39 billion uh, a little over a year ago. Actually, this takeover is already very funny. How an SOE, that is uh, loss-making, can, can do this. I don't think there are many loss-making uh, companies in Europe who can take over for 39 billion euro. So I am, not, I am very surprised that, not, that there is no reaction on this. But why would they take over Syngenta for such a crazy amount of money? This has to do with bringing the technology, and this is not 5G, this is in biotech and all the way, but that's also one of the top 10 sectors. And they want to bring this knowledge to the Chinese market where they can exploit it in a huge domestic place. And they don't do it so much to own Syngenta itself. That's secondary to them. So maybe they do something nice with that. Not all of them do it. Geely is owned, and uh, Volvo. Geely is, is, is owning Volvo. But there, there is a more sophisticated threat. So you cannot always say it's black and white, but it's very clearly that the exploitation of the huge domestic Chinese market is always uppermost in their mind. Okay. Um, then I have two slides on, just giving you some examples. Yeah, what can you put in a slide? But it gives you a, an idea of, uh, you might think something in China, but immediately when you go deeper, you see that it's not true or it's only half true. 
And uh, there are a number of these things that you can quietly and quickly read. But I, I, I must always smile when people say, talk about Chinese standardization. They don't even have standardization bodies. I know not a single country in the world that doesn't have standardization bodies more or less akin to the standardization bodies in the annex of the TBT agreement of, of, of the WTO. China does not. And that has a lot of consequences. As the European Chamber in, 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 in Beijing uh, has expressed it, they are, the state is everywhere when there is a standard, even when it seems not to be the case. So this has profound, and so I can go on. Um, when you push for national treatment in the CHI, in the, in the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, it's not so much that we, in the, let's say, in other, mem in other WTO partners, would have much difficulty in defining that. It's legalistically a bit complex, but basically it's simple. The problem for China is not that they don't understand that, but it disrupts their internal system. Because the system is completely differently designed. So they must now, in the CHI, because that's the core issue of the CHI, they must now sort of undo some of, this, of the systemic features. Of Next one. Next one. Uh, Some people say, hey, how restrictive is China really in FDI? Well, China is very restrictive in FDI. There, there are two key reasons for that. Um, one is the restrictiveness index is consisting of 19 different types of measures, and it's 22 different types of sectors. It's an OECD measure. So it's not, you cannot say one or two things have become less restrictive. And it shows very clearly over time that China, after coming from extreme altitudes, is still very much more restrictive than its four best friends. Brazil, India, and South Africa, uh, I mean, uh, uh, who, who I forget? Uh, and Russia, yeah. Even Russia, I mean, all of these are much less restrictive than China, even after China has so-called become less restrictive. And the second thing is that when people look at this increasing stock of EU FDI in China, part of that is because they can't recreate their profit. The, you're, you're caught in that country, so that's often forgotten. And um, so there are no free alternatives of whether, because there are many complaints in China of some companies from Europe who actually would rather want to leave or who want to at least make a different deal. And so I can go on, but. That is not uh, the last thing I want to also emphasize. Since about five, six, seven years, uh, China has started and increased enormously in numbers the investment funds. And the institute of my neighbor and some others have done research on how these funds look like, really, also in relation to some uh, takeovers. But still, when you look at these funds, it's all state in 25 different forms. Um, there was a recent piece in a, one of the boxes in your publications where this investment fund was led by the Beijing city government. Well, I don't know in Europe or the US, investment funds are like venture capitals or they, they go out to make profit and they might sometimes fail, but as a rule, these are not run by the city of New York or the city of Paris. 19 out of the 20 participants in an investment fund were a state. One was a tiny private company of 1 or 2%. So I want to make sure, I would like to make sure, what these investment funds are. If you know anything about the WTO, is this a way to get around the, the public body text in the WTO? Well, in my mind, it is. It may have an internal rationale of being better than the civil servants, more experienced investment people, but it has the nasty effect, is an investment fund a public body? And therefore, if it's subsidized, can you act as a WTO partner? And the answer is totally unclear. We don't even know much about these investment funds. A lot is not reported. Okay, enough. Next one. So these are the critical questions. Um, I, of course, have no hope that in the few minutes I can try to answer to your great satisfaction. Um, 
The first question, next slide. The first question is, yes, uh, China's high strategy is not entirely unique. And since I don't have much time, I give the example, well, there's also the US, but there are some other examples in the world as well. And it's also, of course, there are many shades of gray because you, if you look at India, or if you look at Brazil, by the way, uh, there's also a lot of intervention. So it's not pure black and white. But look at our own GSM strategy. Later we talk about 5G. This is 2G, and you may smile, that's long ago. But our GSM strategy was very much like what the Chinese now do, without the severe restrictions and controls. Not that, everything else. And I, I, that's why I put uh, five bullet points there. The SOEs at the time were the telecom companies. They had national monopolies, loads of money, and gigantic laboratories. And I think it's very, and, and they were bundling together also the ones who are now in the EU, but they're not like Sweden. And the first GSM chairman was a Swede. Um, and, and so it's very important to see that there was really a, a group investing as much as the entire Apollo program for the GSM. And that's a hell of a lot of money. You can say the government, strictly spoken, didn't subsidize. Well, these were SOEs. They were all, except one, but only halfway the process. And before also it was state-owned. They were all state-owned, and they had huge excess profits from these monopolies. And they decided to go for the new technology and do it very well, because the GSM is a success. And the Hansing Globe is the EU and member state governments, frequencies. And there's a whole story there. But it was somewhat restrictive. It wasn't totally closed for Europeans. For example, Motorola was in there for the components. To, to but in the patent pool, Japan and Korea wanted to get in, and they couldn't get in because the, the, the motto was, if you haven't invested deeply in this, you're not going to get in. Uh, the, but the patent pool namely um, gives, uh, tries to, to, to allow standards which contain patents, uh, so-called uh, uh, patent essential uh, standards, and uh, there would be no fees for all those that had invested. So uh, it's, it's, it's an important thing to see. Next one. Um, yeah, the Chinese approach is holistic. And I list here a number of things that uh, might help you to, uh, and some of which you probably already know. Um, <coughs> the third bullet point, I think, is the most critical one. And actually, Daniel, when beginning, also mentioned scale. Uh, the Chinese, when sc scale doesn't always matter. There's also something like quality and many other things, but scale has, an if, you, if you look, for example, at, um, um, well, let, let me go on, otherwise I don't like it. So the scale benefits are ever more exploited. There's massive funding, there are many investments. I don't know now how many investment funds there are, but the European Chamber two and a half years ago thought there were 700. But if you add 300 a year, and some of these investment funds are huge. Huh? Um, and there is no actual, there's no good reporting on them. And there's also no reporting to the WTO on them. Um, and it's often combined with re restrictions or prohibitions of FDI. Uh, don't think only about mergers of SOEs. SOEs don't go broke in China. When you lose, at some point you would say, now it's enough. No, then you merge them with other SOEs. And uh, so it, it's, it's so-called for the workers, but now that's strictly spoken against the AML. That's the competition law. The competition law is entirely written on European laws, and yet it's done. Also, there's a fantastic article, I think it's fantastic, um, in, 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 in Florence, the EUI, on how enterprise networks in China work. And it's almost invisible, at of, often at the personal level, so there are many more aspects than the things we see in order to see why things are China, China. Uh, the rest I'll, I'll skip. Next. So what, what can trade policy do? Well, I'm not going to read all of that, but you see trade policy can do a lot. The difference in a slide five years ago and this is the language. It says attach consequences, rule out. 
play out already in submitted cases, strict adherence. You, you, you see that where the approach is uh, trying to discipline China, the tone has completely changed. And I think I support that on the whole. But what I don't support, obviously not the way uh, Trump does it, is that we should only be yelling at the Chinese and trying to discipline them. We should still continue to engage China in a number of different ways. And I have mentioned both under multilateral and under bilateral a number of these things. I do. <coughs> Unilateral, we must not give up. And it's therefore I support FDI screening because you look at the letter of the text, it's not going to be a very protectionist instrument at all. Um, and if you look at the, at, the, at the American one, there is some deterrence effect, but the actual cases that have been rejected are very, very few. <laughs> um, next one, because I have to hurry up for the boss. Um, he does some suggestions about FDI other than the CHI itself. The CHI itself, of course, is the mega solution, we hope. Um, but what we could do as the Chinese is things like this. They have a new investment law, as you just said. Well, let's have every half year a meeting, maybe with a number of trading partners and the Chinese authority on how this law is applied. That's soft, that's not a threat, but it's also a help to make the best out of this. And that is the same on the European side. If we ask that from the Chinese, we should also do it with them here. Um, we must know more about these investment funds. And so, whether by the WTO or bilaterally, uh, this is unacceptable what is happening there, even if we don't know exactly the writing on the wall. Next one. Um, on industrial policy, there's a lot to say. Industrial policy is back in Brussels. Um, <coughs> In 2006, as some of you know, I wrote a survey article on European industrial policy going 25 years back. I see a lot of the things now that I've seen before. There's a lot of deja vu, as, as Daniel said. But one thing isn't even mentioned in the recent paper from the think tank of the President of the Commission. The unitary patent. It is this funny court case in Germany that holds it up. But the unitary patent is massively undervalued. We have a big single market. That's why the unitary, every economic article on industrial economics says innovation's most important determinant is a large market. And that is what we should do. The costs go dramatically down. The large market effect, I will not explain that now unless there are questions, goes up with the unitary pattern and we have single litigation over the whole continent. We can exploit this enormously, and we should do it. Last one. There's one more, I think. What can China do? I think here are a number of suggestions that China can do something. And the spirit of this slide is, China, it's time you come out with offering things and not react on ours and, and, and take a defensive and always interest-based approach. Of course, you pursue your interest, but there is very little that China does to make this work from their end, and that is, uh, these are a number of these suggestions that would be extremely helpful. Yes, the EU has a much better relationship with China, but China could do more, not after heavy pressures or another five anti-dumping cases, but in and of itself. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jack. I know knew I was going to ask a lot from uh, from you to be very short on this very complex question. I must say, as an economist, I'm still not satisfied. I hear about the Chinese exploit their internal market. But okay, that makes sense only if you have economies of scale. Which are the sectors where we have these economies of scale? And the second point I heard over and over is how they're restrictive on FDI. Okay but that's their problem. It can only slow down their own development. Of course, some lost profit opportunities for our enterprises, but if they want to slow down the absorption of foreign technology, be our guests, right? I don't see so much the problem with that. But these are the musings of somebody who uh, studied uh, economics at Chicago, so uh, I, I tend... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're going to do that. Let me, uh, without further ado, uh, open uh, the season of questions and answers. 
Um, I know we are very numerous, so sometimes that is difficult. Does somebody like to break the ice? Yeah, why don't we take first then, and there you go. If you could identify yourself first, please. Thank you, Daniel. I'm Henrique Moraes from the Mission of Brazil uh, in Brussels. I have a question for Jan, um, uh, picking up on the point you mentioned about the, the brain drain problem that the EU is facing. Um, do you think that, and from your, your talks with researchers, um, with the, uh, the EU regulation on, on privacy, for example, and data, um, do, do researchers see that as a hindrance to, uh, to the, um, their ability to do research and that's why China is, is so attractive? Is, is this more or less the point you're trying to make? Uh, thank you. Well, it is, it is part of the package in very specific applied fields. It depends, you know, you can't say, you know, a, a whole bulk of data is always good. You know, it really also depends on quality, of course. And indeed, there is European researchers arguing, you know, the data we get in China about the behavior, for instance, of citizens within a certain city is very different from what we would see in Europe. Just to give you a very concrete examples. So it's not quite so helpful in terms of, a, you know, developing applications, for instance, for the European market or the US market. But I think, so, um, still, of course, regulation related to privacy plays a key role in regard to a lot of big, big data-driven applications. And of course, it's better at the end of the day to have more data, if only to find out that it doesn't help, than not to have that data at all. But that's not the only thing. The much more important thing is really funding money. Um, and there, um, you know, I mean, I've given some figures earlier, and I can give you some more afterwards. Um, you know, there, China just excels in many fields. Um, plus, you know, there's a certain spirit um, about, you know, doing something big that, that people appreciate. I should also say, however, if you talk to people on a personal level, and I mean, again, that's anecdotal evidence, obviously, it's not, not it doesn't go for everybody necessarily, but the new mood in, in, in China, obviously, um, so societal control, party rules over everything, I mean, that takes a toll. There's also many people who say, well, like, the conditions here are amazing, I can do the sort of research I could only dream of in Europe, but everyday life is, is tough. Um, so um, I think that there is a bit of a balance. And actually, it's quite interesting. Um, so top-notch researchers, yes, there's more going to China. But when you look at students, actually, European students going to China, numbers are falling by the year. Um, and there's surveys on this. There, there's something about that's less attractive about China as it is changing, frankly, for, for many people. I, I cannot resist temptation, again, as an economist to say, what does it mean, drain, drain? They're buying our researchers. If they're paying a mar market price, <laughs> what's so bad about it? Uh, and then, uh, the, in general, the salaries for researchers in Europe will uh, will increase, and uh, presumably, actually, we have in Europe an increasing supply of researchers. So, if their salaries go up thanks to China, why not? What's a bad thing? The next question was here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Wolfgang Papp. I'm associated with SEPS formerly in the Commission. I'm very much interested in the issue of national sovereignty. There's talk now about cyber sovereignty, particularly in the US and in China. Is Europe more or less uh, lost out entirely here? Or are we going to pool sovereignty as we do with other competences within Europe? France is talking about cyber sovereignty as well. Or do we have just a choice between Huawei and NSA? Okay, let me perhaps try, Paul, are you still on? Yes, I'm on. Perhaps this is something um, you might address. Yeah, I think this is a, this is a great question. I think um, uh, we had a big discussion of this actually last week in, in The Hague with a group looking at the, sort of the, the two views of cyber sovereignty, the, the Chinese view and the, and the, and the Western view. And, um, yeah, and I think Europe obviously falls into to the Western view that um, uh, of viewing the internet and cyberspace as a as a as a, as a commons, uh, whereas of course Russia and China and other countries are pushing for this idea that countries should have the ability to control uh, what's going through their their portion of cyberspace, and in particular that really relates to information control and, and content. Um, uh, management and so, you know, those those uh, issues are are really uh, difficult. The Russians and Chinese have put forward 
um, a number of proposals with the United Nations to, to um, uh, sort of a code of conduct that includes and shines those, those ideas. The U.S. and, of course, European countries have, have no interest in that. Um, and then this is also, I think, uh, almost to some degree, I think a little bit overtaken by by the by the, by the whole ideas around data governance and and how countries uh, control and, and, uh, and personal data flows between between countries. Um, and, and I think that that issue is also going to is is almost um, more important than than the uh, the issue of um, you know of data sovereignty because I think the problem is that that operatively. Uh, China attempts to, to, to uh, for example, to, to, to operationalize data sovereignty by censoring things, censoring the internet very heavily. Um, but um, you know, there's a that, that's a that's sort of a loot in the long run. That's going to be really tough to, to maintain that kind of a system in the face of things like 5G, right? Where that where there's going to be so much more data flowing across borders, um, and I think it's going to be uh, the ability for states to control data. Uh, you know, China has a very good system, but I think it's going to be increasingly under pressure. So I think that the, 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 the broader issues are going to be in Europe. How does how does Europe deal with uh, as was raised earlier this data privacy issue? If Chinese companies are operating in Europe, um, how do, how does how does Europe treat uh, a country like China? Uh, the EU recently signed an agreement with Japan, for example, on data adequacy uh, because it. it, it Argue that Japan's legal system is able to protect data privacy at the same level, basically, as Europe. Now, will China ever be judged adequate uh, on on this issue of data privacy? Uh, this is a really tough issue because um, you know the legal system in China obviously is 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 um, really operates at the behest of the, of the Communist Party, and so no, you know, I, I, it's hard to see any time in the in the, the near term uh, any uh, level of of, of, of uh, and any country judging China to be, have an adequate system, legal system to protect data privacy. So then the question becomes, you know, how does how do you have interoperability in that kind of a world? Um, and I think that's sort of where we are now. Uh, there's a lot of effort in Japan, for example, to to talk about uh, uh, data security, data security alliance. They'll come up with the G20. So I think it's going to be a big topic at the G20. This issue of uh, of how different countries deal with data. Um, and you know the other issues like how law enforcement has access to data. These are really the, the, the tough issues that are that really also, I think, fall under this idea of data sovereignty or cyber sovereignty. Okay, but as long as we have uh, Europe uh, not recognizing China as equivalent in terms of privacy, the solution seems to be easy. No data can be exported. But perhaps I can ask uh, you, because you're sitting in, in Berlin, because the, the if you want the cyber security landscape in Europe is at the regulatory level, it is we have common rules, but the practical implementation in each member country sometimes very very different. And that reminds me of the banking system where we had also common rules, but the supervision was national, um, and in the banking system that had the result that no national supervisor could see any problem with the banks at home, right? And that led us then to the to the problems we had, and I'm afraid that uh, in the in this this supervising the cyberspace, this is so much national still. Do you see any chance that Berlin, meaning the German government, would ever agree to create a European agency, which would really ensure then the cyber security and the and the the cross border flows, but not across borders within Europe, but just from Europe to the rest of the world? Well, I'm not the spokesperson of the German government. I, I think I don't have to be because I think that's not the answer. The answer is whether the German government is willing to heavily invest in venture capital, for instance, to make technologies emerge in Germany or other European countries for that matter. Because, and there I come back to the economist point of view you made, right? Uh, you, you said, well, look, it's all fair market allocation. If talent goes to China, what's the problem if knowledge goes to China? Well, the problem is that knowledge will determine future standards, basically. And those who determine the standards will also define, to a large extent, the rules of the game. So 
in that sense, it is absolutely vital that we step our, up our game here in Europe in terms of technology creation. We can talk all we want about what great data privacy laws we have in Europe and or whether they applied appropriately or not, you know, across member states. But at the end of the day, if we really want to make a, a lasting impact on how the future of data governance will work, we have to have the technology and basically set the standards. And this is something we haven't touched upon at all yet. There again, the Chinese have a very clear plan. You have all heard about the Belt and Road Initiative. They actually have a, have a small leading group, again, one of those animals that make uh, big policy decisions on standardizi standardization along the Belt and Road in the digital domain. This is exactly what they want. They want to set standards because standards you know, are important both in terms of market shares at the end of the day but also in terms of how politics goes about how cyberspace is run. And then again, the notions here are just, as Paul just said, you know, or alluded to, are very, very different. What cyberspace should be, how it should be governed, and so on. So I think, really, it's more about where we put our money and, and that we need to do that much more quickly and more, frankly, in, in terms of our startups, in terms of our IT industry, in terms of our AI research. That's, that's critical. Uh, and that we don't let brain drain happen because that, again, will harm us economically in the long run. One quick question. Let me just jump in there real quickly with just, just to clarify. I think standards is a really important issue, but you have to be careful when you use that word because it means a lot of different things. So in terms of standards, for example, around 5G, that is that is not something that a, a country can, can, for example, dominate. I mean, in that case, Huawei and GTE and other Chinese companies and Ericsson and Nokia all bring their intellectual property. There's a, there's a, there's a discussion technically of which one is, is the best, and then it's a very merit-based system. And then the, the, the standards are chosen for 5G, and then everybody can build to those standards. But that's not something that, that China can, can dominate or a particular, a particular company can dominate. Then there are other areas, like as, as, as John Mian mentioned, on Belt and Road. You know, those, then there's sort of industrial standards around how things are built out um, in those countries along Belt and Road, or whether it's rail or pipelines. And in that case, you know, China's building those those uh, that, that infrastructure, then the, the sort of standards around how those things are built uh, become something that local the countries will maybe may locked into in terms of standards. Uh, and then there's finally there's the issue around things like artificial intelligence, where where um, Europe again is taking the lead, for example, in the in, in trying to develop ethics uh, and guidelines around uh, the development of artificial intelligence algorithms. And I would argue that there that of course that we don't, that one thing we that would be that would probably be bad is is to exclude or have China be sort of an outlier uh, in the global the growing global debate about setting some sort of guidelines around around AI and how it develops. Uh, and that, that's that's another sort of issue, issue around that also has a standards component. Uh, it's being discussed in the I, in the IEC and the ISO, um, uh, also the, the ethical standards. But anyway, the standards. I think we have to just be careful when we talk about standards to just make sure we're talking about. Um, you know, it's not just. Uh, it, it has a very specific meanings in certain contexts. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm conscious as a chairman. One of the, my most important tasks is to deliver at the end of the session in time for the next one to start. So I propose we stop here. The next session will go much more into the digital aspects, maybe also the standards. And I wanted to thank my panel very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> the chair will now be taken by Lorenzo Popillo. So hi, my name is Lorenzo Pupillo. I'm uh, leading the Cybersecurity Accepts Initiative. I'd like to call the panelists here for the second panel. Um, we have Jan Peter Kleins for Director of the Stiftung Foundation, Carl Christian Burr, and Ben Scott, Senior Policy Advisor for Telecom and 5G, National Cybersecurity Center. Well, uh, I think that we, uh, we heard quite a bit in the first panel that we are facing this uh, uh, tech war, you know, um, between uh, the, um, you know, China and the U.S. And there have been this uh, concept of, uh, like, uh, a growing, uh, a challenging country, uh, country challenging the incumbent powers uh, uh, in terms of technology. And... Uh, you know, like uh, um, 
Daniel mentioned the case of, you know, like the, the new industrialized countries. They were, you know, coming to Europe and the idea was uh, are stealing the technology. Uh, for instance, also, um, Jacques mentioned the case of 2G as an example of uh, all of Europe type of approach to technology. But something that uh, I think it's important to notice that at that time, there was no such a big concern about security. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we built to some extent uh, internet. There was uh, a network, an insecure network to some extent because uh, you know, didn't have uh, built-in security. Uh, today instead, uh, we feel a lot this type of concern because uh, uh, you know, 5G it's, um, uh, will be particularly important and uh, for 5G, uh, Securities are very critical issues. Why is that? Because uh, 5G basically it will be uh, based on uh, uh, extensively based on software, software virtualization, software file network, and software call automatically the world of uh, vulnerabilities. You know, we uh, at SEPS we have done a task force on this on on vulnerability disclosure because each, uh, uh, no matter how good are the software, the program, each program has about 14 vulnerabilities. And so these are very critical issues. Furthermore, uh, for uh, 5G, the architecture of 5G will basically blurring the, disti the distinction between core of the network and the edge. So uh, pulling, no, pushing the security toward the edge will create uh, additional concern. So I think it's extremely important that today we will address this issue of uh, security and 5G in this uh, international uh, uh, contest you know, of this uh, race for technology between uh, uh, China, Europe, and the US. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have a particularly qualified panel because I have chosen specific uh, uh, people. They have done ad hoc work on this. And uh, we will start with, uh, with um, sorry. with Jan Peter Kranenz uh, from the Stiftung Foundation because uh, he wrote a very interesting paper on uh, 5G national security and uh, we'll start with that. Thank you, Lorenzo, and thanks for having me. Um, as Lorenzo said, I, um, for the last one and a half years I worked on 5G security from a, a government national security perspective and when I started my work, I was wondering what, what are we actually talking about? What are we worried about from a, from a national perspective? Um, because especially if you think back maybe to December last year, January this year, the debate was messy to say the least. We have a, the, the feeling that on the one side 5G is the, the new holy grail, the new technology that will do everything that we envision when we talk about smart city, connected cars, um, modern healthcare, and so on and so on. But at the same time, it seems that there's a lot of pressure because the mobile network operators right now, for example, in Germany, are bidding for the frequencies to utilize the, the new technology. So right now in Germany, the, the 5G frequency auction is ongo ongoing and we almost broke the six billion euro um, figure for the, um, for the four MNOs, who, uh, mobile network operators who participate. So it's a lot of money we talk about. It's a lot of investment from the operator side. And now the governments, it feels like, started to worry about, well, who, where, where does actually the equipment come from on which our economy and society will rely on for the next decade or even longer. So it's interesting to me first and foremost that we, when we talk about 5G and um, Chinese manufacturers, at no point was the discussion about a Chinese mobile operator entering the European market. We didn't talk about that. It's not that China Telecom wants to enter the European market. But we talked about governments looking at the supply chain of their national 
mobile network operators and being worried about the fact that a lot of the technology that will be rolled out in their own country comes from um, China or, or other foreign countries. So that's the, the first interesting thing. What are we talking about? We talk about the supply chain. Second of all, why are the governments worried? Well, you have to understand that we are now in a time of complexity of ICT systems that it's completely impossible to prove the absence of malicious code. If you have dozens or even hundreds of millions of lines of code, we don't talk about tens of, tens of thousands of lines of code, not hundreds of thousands, we talk about millions of lines of code and highly interconnected systems of systems. And that means there is no mechanism, no magic tool, nothing we can do to prove that a specific device or a specific piece of software does not have any malicious code inside. If you are a state actor, and state actors are defined by unlimited budget, unlimited time, and highest level of commitment, you will always find a way to include malicious code into a piece of software or hardware. So we cannot trust the device. No matter what anybody says, be that um, a certification body or a national security agency who, who looked at the particular piece of, of hardware, there's no way to prove the absence of malicious code. You cannot trust the device. Okay, so now suddenly, if you cannot trust the device, you have to trust the manufacturer, that the manufacturer keeps this device secure, that they provide software updates, that they have the house in order, and so on. Well, and then from a government perspective, it's understandable that the extent to which you trust a manufacturer depends on the jurisdiction out of which it operates. The legal system, the rule of law, has an impact on the trustworthiness of a company. And interestingly, if you look at the Prague proposals, you find that term, the rule of law, that should be included as part of the risk assessment. And I think that's understandable, again, from the, from the government perspective, that it makes a different difference from the European perspective if a device comes from the States, from Sweden, or from China. Not because of the technology. The technology might be as secure in all these, um, from all of these three companies, but because of the underlying rule of law. And if you keep that in mind, then it's, it's kind of understandable that with 5G, the pressure that the, the um, economy has or mobile network operators have to deploy the, um, the technology. And truth be told, for the, five, for the last five to 10 years, 5G has been vastly oversold by marketing. I mean, there is no, there is no technology in the world that can fulfill all the promises that are connected to 5G. At the end of the day, 5G, first and foremost, is massive infrastructure investments. And even if the frequency auctions are over th this year or next year, it will take many, many years until the operators actually deploy these systems and utilize the new frequencies. And then the question is, well, what is the reason for an operator to do that? And is it really, is already everything lost from a European perspective that we, we didn't catch the train and now the, the next industrial revolution and the next infrastructure revolution um, continues without, the, without us? I don't think so. And the previous panel um, also said we, we need to get our act together. If we continue to look at um, at China and the, the amount of strategy they, ha they have and the amount of money they have, then we lose track of the, of the core issue. Because w first and foremost, we should think about how can we deploy a highly resilient and highly trustworthy infrastructure on which our future economy and society can be built on and can rely on. And then we don't so much talk about a spe specific company or country, but we talk about vendor agnostic, 
rules of engagement, requirements. What are the rules of the game for an operator, for a vendor, to deploy infrastructure in Europe? We are just building those up with the Prague proposals, with the 5G recommendations from the Euro European Commission, with the guidelines um, from uh, BNETS and BSI in, in Germany. We just started that. We just started to think more thoroughly about mobile network infrastructure and what we have to ask regarding security and resilience from both operator and, um, and vendor. And I think it's good that we do that. It's a bit late, as always, but it, we started. So let's not throw up our hands, but continue on that trajectory. And then, interestingly, the, 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 first, um, the first panel also mentioned the technological dependency issue. If we talk about a trustworthy and resilient network, what came up in media and also in the, in, in the governments are basically two main issues, two scenarios that are worrisome. The first is industrial espionage, and the second is sabotage or network disruption in case of conflict. But I would agree actually with the first panel that the technological dependency in the long term is the issue that we, that we should focus on because the, the first two cases, we can manage the risk. If we talk about industrial espionage, historically, the mobile network played almost no role for large industrial espionage campaigns from um, the, um, the Chinese intelligence services and the PLA. Typically, if you look at APTs, Advanced Persistence Threats, so just a funny name for state-run um, hacks, email was the number one attack vector. Exploiting, exploiting um, email from an administrator and um, sending an, um, a malicious attachment is the number one attack vector because we can send people, well, not people, but we can send rockets to the Mars and we eradicated smallpox, but in 2019, we cannot build an operating system that cannot be exploited with a single click of a button. So still today, if you open an, a malicious attachment, there's a chance that you, inf that you infect your entire network. And this is highly effective for industrial espionage. And I, at least, don't see any indicator that in the foreseeable future, the business email will lose its relevance. So yes, with 5G, the stakes are higher, there are more, there's more interesting data running on the network, and it might become a new attack vector for industrial espionage, but we still have that buggy email. We still have the, <laughs> we still have the malicious, malicious attachment that your receptionist or your HR um, manager has to open because it's an application for a new job. So, Industrial espionage is an issue. It's an issue with, uh, with China that we have to address, but connecting mobile networks and industrial espionage is at least questionable. On top of that, maybe a little bit of, of history regarding internet and security. Industrial espionage in the mobile network is an issue because we want access to the network. At the end of the day, for the, for the last decades, the state had the, and wanted the power to access telecommunication networks for law enforcement purposes or um, for intelligence purposes. So what we do not have right now in the mobile network is things like end-to-end -end encryption. At the end of the day, the mobile national um, operator has to give access to the national law enforcement agency if they want to surveil or tap into a, a phone call. So by design, on that, in that instance, our networks are vulnerable because we have a clash of public safety, the need to do law enforcement work, and IT security. If you want a highly resilient and trustworthy network, you want end-to-end -end encryption. You want as much encryption as possible. If you want access from the, for law enforcement to your network, you do not want end-to-end -end encryption. 
So we have to we have to recognize that um, uh, clash clash of um, goals or, or a conflict of inf of interest. Um, and by design, by design, that's a vulnerability, and it will continue to be a vulnerability because this is how how our mobile networks are um, are being deployed. And lastly, the the point of the of the Chinese kill switch, the the sabotage case um, case uh, in in term of an uh, of an conflict, maybe even armed conflict. As I said before, right now there is no way to prove the absence of malicious code. And this, because of this lack of proof, the argument for a hypothetical kill switch, no matter how unlikely or um, how neither, no matter how hard to pull off, will always be open. And because this argument is open, we, we always get lost in this discussion about, well, but maybe Maybe they can do it. What about if there actually is a kill switch? What I think we shouldn't forget in that scenario is we still talk about commercially operated mobile networks in a case of an maybe even armed conflict. So at the end of the day, you have, you have to ask yourself the question, what can you require a commercially run network to do in an armed conflict. If you want highly resilient communication in case of a conflict, maybe you don't want to do it with a commercially run network. Maybe you have to deploy other types of technology and maybe you have to be able to invest the, the type of money and the resources to deploy such a network. But we talk about very different th things. You cannot ask of a commercially run network to be highly resilient even in, an, in a case of conflict. So there we have to, we have to be also honest to ourselves and, um, and say, well, we need to stick to realistic scenarios. Of course, the armed conflict is an issue, but then we need to maybe need to talk about network design and um, the, the role the, the army plays in this, the military, what type of... Um, um, of technology we can deploy for our military, how reliant our military should be on commercially operated networks and 5G technology. And this is also the debate that we see in the US happening. I can, um, I can recommend to, to all of you, and that's my, my last point, uh, to read from the Department of Defense um, their new report from their innovation board on 5G and national security. Already in the first pages, it's, in my opinion, one of the most honest reports that I have seen coming out from the US because they plainly state in 4G, we were the technology leaders. We have the standard essential patents. This led us to, um, um, to our app economy that is highly profitable. And in, four, in 5G, we do not want to lose this. And if we lose it, if, the, if we lose the technological leadership, then we, are, we might be dependent on foreign technology, even for our military. And this we do not want. So this is a very honest assessment that with 5G, we do not talk so much that what the, the, the pressure point is not so much the security and trustworthiness of the technology itself, but that shift regarding technological dependency that we do not live in a unipolar world anymore where the US is a uh, tech leader, but we see a shift in a bipolar world where you have some tech coming out of US still, but more and more standards and tech coming out of China. And for me, the, the big question is, what's Europe's role in this? Shouldn't we slowly get our act together and figure out not just what we do not like about China or what's our problem with the US, but Where's our role in that? Where's our constructive role in an ICT-defined and software-defined world where you need to be able to, to build and innovate tech and not just try to create rules out of thin air? Thank you very much. So what is the role of Europe? 
let's give the word to Carl Christian Bruhl. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, Jan Peter said it all very admirably, so I thank you very much for these remarks. They are very refreshing compared to some of the remarks I am sometimes uh, exposed to when discussing this topic, so uh, really uh, very impressive. So um, I can agree with basically 99% of what you said. Um, uh, that also allows me to be much shorter in, in what I wanted to say about uh, certain aspects because you, you laid the groundwork uh, so well. Um, so just a few words on the, on the Commission recommendation on 5G. You know that the member states, uh, heads of state and government have recognized the importance of this topic, which I think is a good uh, development, also the fact that they did this together, so not uh, everybody at home saying this is important, uh, you know, services do something about it, but that they had actually met around the table and agreed that this is an important thing for all of them. I think this lifts it to an additional uh, higher level. Uh, we, we took the ball up and we put out this recommendation. What this basically does, I mean, I'm, I'm very candid here, what it basically does is kind of invites the member states to do what they should have been doing, and I'm sure some of them have been doing already, but not all, uh, namely to have a structured and systematic assessment of the situation in order to achieve some of the things that Jan Peter already achieved here, namely clarity about what we are what we are talking about here. What is the actual issue we want to address? What are the concerns we are having? Maybe rate them in order of priority, and then to see what can be done about each of them. And then uh, I add an additional point. Um, there can be problems that you already have a solution for, you just need to use it. There's a tool that is applicable to that and then let's go apply, apply it. There are laws out there, for example, you give uh, obligations on uh, companies who, who run uh, and build uh, uh, telecommunications networks and you can require them to do certain things. So you have your tool there, the question is then how do you use it? What are the requirements you should lay on these people uh, and, and what do you do this for? So for that you need some kind of analysis. Then there can be problems for which we have no tool yet then maybe we need to create a tool. That's wh why it's also important to do this at European level, because we, d we think it would be much slower if all the member states individually would start to put out new statutes that would then allow them to put obligations of some kind on, on certain parties. So that's, in, in a nutshell, the logic for, or, or the justification for the logic we've chosen, namely to invite member states to do risk assessment uh, at national level, to share this with their peers, so in Europe, uh, with all the other member states and with the Commission, and then to come together uh, at, uh, to the table and basically draw up what we call a toolbox. So the uh, toolbox sounds very messy, like this, uh, like the, <laughs> the way you described the, the public uh, debate about this topic so a few months ago, maybe, maybe still today sometimes. Um, it sounds a bit messy, but what we have actually in mind is a kind of table uh, where you say, okay, here's the ki here are the kinds of problems and concerns we're having, and here are the kinds of uh, uh, tools we could use, the kind of answers we could have, and the maybe kinds of new tools that we need to develop. Uh, and then ideally, and we have to see, wait and see whether that could be the outcome, we would have some kind of agreement, a certain consensus as to what are the things we should be doing to meet certain of these concerns. Uh, uh, you were talking about uh, the fact that we cannot prove a negative. Uh, nevertheless, there might be many, many baseline requirements that even today are not at all assured, uh, and we could assure them by uh, uh, enforcing uh, certain uh, technical standards, by insisting on certification, also talking about tools. We just created a new uh, certification framework at European level, which is a tool that is still you know, waiting to be used. Uh, it comes into force only next month, so maybe we are excused for not having used it yet, but we need to do so very quickly. That's an example of where you could answer certain of these questions, certainly not all of them, but some of them. And so that is my expectation as to what should come out of this, uh, out of this um, exercise. Also, you have to be very clear about it, and we heard it earlier in the, in the earlier panel. Uh, in, in European law, it's often the case that we have uh, European rules that are on paper the same in the member state, but then they're enforced by the national authorities, uh, like, you know, the police in every city is a different body, but they're enforcing the same laws, same logic here. Uh, and uh, we have the situation here too. And so the, the, po the important thing is then that these responsible uh, authorities actually act and, and take the measures because we cannot take them in Brussels. There's no, I mean, the, using the word competence may be wrong, but we, we, there's no way we can take these measures because it's not our work, it's not our task. The member state authorities, it's their task. And what we simply aim for is that they talk to each other and maybe have a uh, go all more or less in the same direction. I don't think we will see a completely uniform response. That's maybe too too ambitious, uh, but, but certainly much more uniformity than we had uh, so far. And this brings me, and that then links to the bigger global questions. You also alluded to them, because in the long run, maybe security is not about 
certain obligations and certain standards, but maybe in the long run, security is about whether we will still be able to actually have these discussions in the future. I invite you to consider that in this field, it's actually an anomaly. We have two European suppliers who are actually in this market. It's not the case in many, many other very important uh, industrial areas, uh, despite uh, all our efforts, and uh, you know, that giving also rise to new uh, European initiatives that try to get back into the game in many of these fields. Here we are still in the game in a, in a quite impressive way, actually, if you consider it. Uh, so in a way, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a luxury problem, if you like. Uh, so we wouldn't even be able to have this discussion where we're talking about a different type of technology. So we should really get this right here and really consider that in the long term, maybe it's more important to ensure that these companies can still exist in 20 years and 30 years and continue to innovate and continue to be a supplier that maybe keeps also the other guy honest. Uh, because if you all know the problems of, of monopoly uh, and if the monopoly is then uh, coupled with uh, problems of maybe rule of law at home, well, I don't want to go into details there, but you can imagine that this might, might actually exacerbate the problems of, of monopoly or the challenges. Um, we maybe should have an interest in making sure that we have European companies here uh, in this field and in other fields, and this links to the sovereignty argument you made. So in the long term, all of that may not be about the technical details, but really about the question, what does Europe, what can Europe do to ensure that this game is not played without us. And so my answer to that, and it was also stated by, by you in the earlier panel, actually, uh, we need to invest. Uh, we need to invest uh, across the board. And member states should not just uh, talk about the dangers, but also about the opportunities and uh, taking taking these steps. There's no reason why Europe, uh, given the size of its economy, shouldn't be able to invest at the required scale. It just needs to take the decision. And uh, what we try to do, and sometimes I feel a bit uh, lonely in that, in, in Brussels, is basically we write down these uh, this analysis and then we actually get the member states together we even get them to agree to that and we all write it down together but then it still doesn't happen to the extent uh, we want to but what we then do is we continue uh, pushing for that because what else can you do I, I don't think the answer can be uh, we are a bit behind in the race here and there so let's stop it and uh, you know Maybe sometimes you need to prioritize, but I think we are just only, we have already prioritized. We talk about a very important area here, digitization for the future. I think nobody can deny that this will be one of the fundamental uh, uh, technology areas, industrial areas for the future, and so we cannot afford uh, sitting back on that one. And I'm, I'm, I'm consciously making this link here to the bigger picture. You know, think cybersecurity at large, think about artificial intelligence, think about microchips. I mean, we have microchips everywhere and anywhere. We don't have a high-end uh, production facility in Europe today, and there's a question of whether we will have it uh, when, when the new generation comes around. It costs a few billion euros, yes, but if you want it, you need to, you need to create it, and you need to create the, the uh, conditions for doing that. And I mean, this is, this is our goal, this is what we call, uh, you know, I know the word is often discussed industrial policy, but uh, this, is, this is it, ultimately. We're talking about standardization, we're talking about investment and in, in, in the right areas. Um, and it's no surprise that this discussion also comes up when we talk about 5G security, because here we're talking about this underlying infrastructure that will allow all these other things to function, to connect to each other. Um, I also share your assessment, by the way, uh, as regards the, the issue about um, uh, the um, industrial espionage and the fact that uh, actually this should not be the biggest discussion point in the room if we talk about 5G security. Um, and also, not to be too simplistic about how these networks function. I mean, we have, as you said, we have operators. We don't have them just signing a piece of paper and all the rest is done out of Beijing. It's, it's not like that. Uh, and if it's in, for some operators it's more like that than for others, maybe this is this is one of the points where we should uh, take these uh, measures that I, that I was talking about earlier. Now, just very concretely, the timing of this exercise is very ambitious. Uh, we've invited member states to complete the risk assessment by uh, the end of June. Uh, and then at European level, uh, uh, our cybersecurity agency will pull this together, together with the national authorities by, by October. And the aim for having this toolbox on the table is, is the end of the year. Obviously, everything feels late if you already have some completed and ongoing uh, frequency uh, auctions going on. But as you also said, and as frankly also our experience is over the last few years, sadly, uh, these investments in, in, uh, in high-end uh, connectivity infrastructure are, are always a bit slower than we would have hoped. and so. Therefore, once again, it's not too late uh, to, to take the right steps. I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Jan, uh, also Carl, presented this uh, uh, trade-off, okay, on this, uh, when we look at this issue of uh, security of, um, of 5G. And um, um, one of the reasons for which I invite also the UK National Cybersecurity Center, because I thought that the the type of initiative they were doing uh, were to some extent quite balanced, you know, in the approach to this issue. Uh, so I would like to give the floor to Ben Scott to present the view. Thank you, 
Lorenzo. Good afternoon, everybody, and it's great to be here at SEPS in Brussels. Um, so I'm going to be a good student and start with the question that was posed on the agenda. Um, plurality of suppliers, technical expertise, and rational assessment of risks based on equipment testing and security risk, man risk management, should not these be the way forward? Yes. Um, that's the end of my <laughs> remarks. Um, that I, that, that the equipment testing um, point is slightly more nuanced than that, and, um, and my colleagues on the panel have already um, sort of explained in ve very well some of the drawbacks and limitations there is to um, certification and, and, and standardization of products. There is one that I would add into that list of things, though, which we need to do, and that's what I'll focus my comment on, and that is we should r not forget previous experience, and we should learn from what we have already um, gone through. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you hear, listen to the press, 5G is new, technological revolution, advanced use cases, it's science fiction, fantastical things will happen with it. The best line that I hear with 5G is that it will be used for things we can't even conceive of. Right? Excellent. What does that mean? Um, as a member of government charged with trying to deliver cybersecurity for the UK, I shudder to think how I'm supposed to be measured on whether I delivered delivering security for things that cannot be conceived of. Um, but one thing is for sure, whatever happens with 5G, it is very likely that the impact of a successful attack on a 5G network, vice a 4G network, will be greater because some of the things that it is likely to be used for will be able to deliver greater impact when you get into smart cities, traffic signaling, those types of things. So cybersecurity is therefore very important. But some things really don't change. State intent is one. So in the UK last year, we attributed cyber attacks against the UK's telecoms networks to hostile states. Those states will continue to want to try and attack the UK in a 5G world as they have done in a 4G world. They aren't going to want to attack us more in the future than they are now, hopefully. Therefore, we need to assume that intent will remain. And good security principles from now and good security principles from 10 years ago are also likely to be good security principles 10 years hence. So let's not forget some of the things we've done. The other thing that doesn't change, and this is really important when I finish, is the laws of physics. The laws of physics will remain the same forever. Um, the speed of light, and let's not get into an Einsteinian debate about relativity, is constant, and that is really important in 5G, and I'll explain why at the end. So elements of our 4G security model are still relevant. In the UK, we already assume failure of equipment uh, or exploitation of equipment um, by a state actor. And we design our networks to limit any damage that is caused by such a failure. We do that already. It will be sensible to continue doing that in the future, and we will do. A few other things that we do um, now and will be just as relevant going forward. Vendor selection. So it is absolutely true to say that despite what, what we said about equipment uh, standards and the difficulty of being able to certify out malicious uh, code, that if you use equipment from a strong vendor who has a track record of producing high quality products, then that is a good thing. Um, Unfortunately, the standard of telecoms equipment across the board is average at best, we would say. And some of it um, is below that. Our um, well-publicized um, documentation explaining um, some of the current, limits, current problems that we have found with Huawei equipment used in the UK are well known. The HCSEC Oversight Board report is published 
um, and, and is available on our website. So we can encourage operators to favor vendors who um, make products the right way. We can ask vend operators of networks to limit the role of vendors that do not make equipment the right way. And we do this now. So we already limit where some equipment manufacturers are allowed to place their equipment and we keep them out of sensitive bits of the network that we care about the most. That will be sensible to do in the future. And the third thing is that diversity is really important. So despite what points one and two that I've just made, a diverse supply of your um, telecoms equipment is really important. If you become dependent on one company, then that is a very dangerous position to be. And that will build in a lot of risk. If you scale that across all operators, then as a country, you become dependent on one company. Again, that is not a situation that you probably want to be in. Once you've made your vendor selection, though, you then look at how you are architecting the networks. So, as I mentioned, you need to try and architect the network so they are tolerant to any single failure. You use that diversity of supply to ensure that the equipment is mixed in a way where any systemic failure with one particular manufacturer's equipment is limited. So it does not spread throughout the network and cause catastrophic damage. However, even if you've selected your vendors and architected your network properly, operator practice, and Carl Christian sort of mentioned that what we don't do is, as operators is sign a bit of paper and give the keys to Beijing. Well, it's not far off, I'm afraid. In some cases, um, some practice is, is quite... Um, shoddy within operators. So if you allow third party access to your equipment to run updates and patching on your networks and you don't monitor or audit what is happening, that's pretty silly because your certified equipment with no back doors, allegedly, has now just been left open for somebody to walk in there and do things to. That was a bit daft. You probably don't want to do that. Um, and there are lots of other bits of operator practice which really need to be tightened up. We're trying to tighten them up in the current world and we will need to do that going forward. So all of those things are just as important in 5G as they are now. So what is different then? Well, as far as I sort of can, can see, there are, there are three significant differences from a security perspective. The first is that the core of the network is more important than ever. As we've said, it becomes software-based, virtualization is key. Um, and that means a security model looks very different. No longer are you trying to protect boxes of equipment in network centers. It is about trying to secure software and virtualization layers. The key there is that the trust that you need to have in the, per in the manufacturer supplying that equipment therefore goes up. You have to trust them more to build things the right way. The other big change is that you end up with vastly more cells. So in the UK at the minute, there are about 25,000 cell sites to cover the UK. That number will go up lots, and we don't know what lots looks like. We really don't, but it will go up lots. What that means is that you end up with cells all over the place in weird places, and you can't assure physical security of all those cell sites. So you do need to think about the, the security sensitivity of bits of the access network increase, and you need to apply different controls to it than you do now. The final thing, and this gets back to my speed of light point from earlier, is that intelligence function does move towards the edge. Intelligent function of the network moves towards the edge. But it is not true to say that that means that there is no discernible difference between the core and the edge. Certainly, you could set up a network in a way where there was no discernible difference. If you so chose, you could make every one of your base stations the intelligent point of the network. And certainly in some geographies, 
you will need to do that. If you are the size of a continent with low population density, you are probably going to need to do that to be able to push 5G capability out to all users. If you are a small island, let's say, densely populated, let's say, then you probably don't. Because the speed of light is such that you, as an end user, need to be about 30 kilometers away from the nearest intelligent bit of the network to be able to get the full benefits of a 5G network in terms of low latency communication. In the UK, 30 kilometers covers a lot of people and a lot of cells. So you do not need to put intelligent function at every single base station in the UK. You would be mad to. Because what that means is you are building yourself a security headache. So the core sensitivity does move out. You do get more bits that you need to protect more. But it is wrong to say that you need to go all the way in some countries. And our country is one way you can apply that model to. So to sum up, rolling out 5G is really is about taking existing good practice, changing a few things, and then trying to make the entire sector better at security. Because the impact of a successful attack on a 5G network rises and increases. And some of the things that the guys on the panel have already said about increasing operator practice, looking at what you can do to provide some sort of basic assurance about product quality are really, really important things that should help in that. Thank you very much, Ben. So we have about uh, 15, 20 minutes for a discussion. So. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Smitham, and I currently work for Huawei Technologies in Brussels. Uh, I just wanted to go back, first of all, uh, to our first speaker's uh, point. Um, it was a while ago, and I might be misremembering it, but you were making a point on state actors and the rule of law. But you did say quite clearly that state actors have the capability and the competence and the motivation, so they're going to do it anyway. So could you elaborate a bit more on the detail of what you mean by the relevance of the rule of law, considering that a state actor with the capability and the motivation is going to be going to install anything anyway. So example for rule of law and why it matters for the manufacturer um, would be United States Apple case, San Bernardino. So in the United States, Apple fought in front of the court against handing over data to law enforcement. And they could do that because of the legal environment. And in some other states, this setting might be tricky. The scenario might not happen. So the, the, with the rule of law part, um, I meant that I can fully understand why, for example, in the Prague proposals, the rule of law of the jurisdiction of the manufacturer is part of the risk assessment. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be the, the or let's say, I don't know if it should be the main factor, but it should be taken into account because this impacts the trustworthiness um, regarding a foreign manufacturer. And the state actor part is basically the other perspective, the attacker, right? So this goes more in the direction of um, certification um, and, and testing. I think certification, just like Ben um, said, I think certification um, is crucial and security assessment is crucial. But we should also be realistic about what it can achieve. It brings us a certain part of the way, but then for further risk minimization, and what we also already see in the UK happening and in um, and the European level happening, you have to switch to the, let's say, non-technical domain. So you have to talk about network planning, about redundancy, about multi-vendor strategy. With there you, s you switch away from a focus on the device toward a focus on a non-tech domain. And with that you try to minimize the risk of, a, of an attack from a state actor. 
because we like the the interesting thing is with 5G at least in my perception we never talk about organized crime because implicitly everybody agrees that um, organized crime is probably not highly interested in in mobile network disruption uh, sabotage and so on so we always talk about state actors and because we talk about state actors and their um, capabilities, certification bring, doesn't bring us all the way. We have to switch to, to non-tech domains. This is, uh, does it make it a bit clearer what I, what I meant? Okay. While we are speaking, there's just a headline in the uh, Financial Times that uh, phone calls on uh, Apple uh, phones, or for for by, by, by WhatsApp, were used to inject uh, Israeli spyware. Um, and it was not quite clear whether it was state-sponsored or the private company. I think it illustrates the complexity <laughs> of, the, of the issues. But my question was more practical, if you want more specific about the 5G and the multi-vendor strategy. As far as I know, in many countries, uh, Huawei delivers, I don't know, X percent, a uh, large percentage of the base stations, and a large percentage is uh, uh, delivered by, by other vendors. Now, then you talked about the importance of software updates. Now, I don't understand. Is, that, is each part of the system evolving differently? Are they not interoperable? And if we have we are afraid of the killer switch, would that killer switch only apply to the base stations of one vendor or how could it go through the entire system? So that's why I, I don't understand how we can have different vendors but still be afraid of a killer switch by any one of them when all of this has to be uh, interoperable. Um, I would like to ask uh, also add a question to what uh, just uh, Daniel asked. Sometimes people say that we look at, uh, at uh, 5G security with the mentality of 4G. In other words, that uh, we have a physical uh, piece of equipment. Instead, in this case, because it's much more software based, so the problem is that uh, if you test something today, because there is continuous updating in the software, this creates a new challenge. And so, the, you know the, in other words, there is a, a dynamic issue here. Um, yeah, so, so that's absolutely right. The intelligence bits of the network are software-based. They are regularly updated. But there are significant bits of the network which are still relatively dumb, um, and that's uh, the bit closest to the, closest to the edge, closest to the end, the end user, um, which are updated in a different way. The interoperability does exist. The, the, the pre I disagree with the premise of the question in, in sort of in a way, in that this idea of a, 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 a big red kill switch button, um, I don't think we believe it necessarily exists or what it looks like. We certainly don't know what it looks like. There are le lots of other ways of conducting the same type of attack and the same sort of damage, um, which would don't, don't require takeover of the equipment. For example, you would you would you would achieve the same um, ends through a different, easier means, probably. I don't know if you've got a answer. Maybe just um, to the to the software part, and uh, everything is is more software defined. Um, Yes, of course, in, in the 5G world, we have much more software-defined functionality, but let's not forget that we talk just about one infrastructure. So we, al we already have a lot of national critical infrastructure that also will be more software-defined. So let's not kid ourselves. If our society and the economy become more interconnected and the information network is not just anymore about human to human communication but much more about machine to machine communication and value chains this makes us uh, makes us more vulnerable by default independent of which manufacturer um, deploys that technology so in any case 
exactly like, um, like Ben said before, we have to step our game regarding risk assessment and risk mitigation. But in my opinion, this, is, this has nothing to do with um, in, a, in a certain type of technology, more or less uh, software-defined functionality, but this is true across the board because ICT is relevant for every single um, industry and every, every single infrastructure, and ICT means software. I'm Romain, I'm working for a consulting company uh, called Teneo. So we, um, are we likely to see the concept of uh, critical infrastructure uh, evolving in, uh, especially in the next uh, uh, European uh, um, political cycle, as and especially the rules attached to it, so under the NIS uh, directive, for instance, and the, and the Cybersecurity Act, as there was um, in the discussion on election integrity and security. Some politicians call for extending the, the concept and the definition of critical infrastructure for, for instance, to election electoral systems. Um, so to which extent are we likely to see changes in regulations? Yeah, I, if I may add also, I <laughs> have two questions for you. I noticed reading the, if I'm not wrong, eh, I noticed reading the the recommendation from the Commission that uh, while the Cybersecurity Act uh, talk about uh, uh, certification, but it's not a mandatory way. Instead, in the recommendation, you are mentioning uh, the uh, in a uh, you know a mandatory way the the certification of 5G equipment. Is this correct? This might be something new. Well, I mean, if you mean that, that there is no. Um, in coherence between the two. We have always said that the Cybersecurity Act creates a tool, which is a tool to create cybersecurity certification schemes. Then you have a scheme. What you do with the scheme is the next question. You do that elsewhere. And we have always said, even before the Cyber Act was adopted uh, and proposed and discussed, that uh, the European level, but also member states, might of course say, well, I make a regulation here now based on whatever legal base, and it a part of it requires that a certain technical specification be be, be used, be made mandatory in, in an uh, appropriate context. That was always clear that this would be possible. The old discussion in the Cybersecurity Act was whether you would build that already into the Cybersecurity Act. Uh, and we were not uh, really in favor from the, for that from the beginning because, of course, it's a bit difficult to make something obligatory that doesn't exist yet. Uh, because, of course, this was about making something obligatory that would come out of a process, and this regulation defines uh, the process. Now, in the end, it almost happened because uh, there was uh, a lot of interest in that in, in the Council, but what would would have done would have been to create a kind of fast track uh, uh, in legislative terms by which it would have been possible for the Commission to uh, table a new legislation that would exactly do what I said earlier, namely then reference a certain cybersecurity certification scheme and make it mandatory for a certain application area. This was what the discussion was about. This didn't happen, but it doesn't mean that you cannot in the future, turn around and take one of these schemes and make it mandatory for a certain application area. And this is what the, uh, the recommendation says. Okay, so in that sense, it is true, it's a step further, but uh, it was always intended uh, to, to be used that way. And I'm quite sure that we will see a similar debate in other areas, which is why it makes much more sense to, to, to do it outside of the Cyber Act, because of course that's in a certain extent agnostic to what are the actual areas uh, that would be covered by the cybersecurity certification schemes. I also remind you that um, part of the Cybersecurity Act is that there will be a, a basically a work program, a, a prioritization list of areas that will be, uh, will be dealt with. So which scheme uh, is, is being worked on first, second, and third, and when, when would they come out? So this is something that the Member States and the Commission will discuss together and decide uh, together to make sure that the, the work can uh, proceed uh, efficiently. Uh, and there you already see that. I mean, this, this is not decided yet. Huh? The Act is not even law. It will be published only in June. Um, your question. Uh, there has been a lot of debate already about the NIS Directive even before it has, <laughs> has been adopted in 2016 because it, it come stems actually from 2013 uh, in, in the original proposal. Um, of course, I cannot uh, preempt what the next commission would, would do because, uh, again, we don't know yet 
who this is <laughs> and what their priorities will be. Uh, but I'm quite sure that uh, this is one of the areas uh, where there will be a lot of discussion and certainly many people proposing that the NS directive be not only reviewed but possibly also opened and, and renewed and updated. And the point you're making is a very pertinent one. And in fact, uh, when studying the implementation and transposition, technically speaking, of the, of the directive international law, we've already seen that member states uh, in some cases went beyond what was the minimum requirement of the NS directive, basically designating other areas uh, as, um, uh, as essential uh, services. This is relevant for the identification of uh, operators of such services who then have additional requirements put upon them. Um, for example, in some areas they have, in some member states they even identified the public sector as one of these, which would then presumably cover at least part of the election uh, relevant uh, uh, infrastructures. Uh, and we might see more of that in, in other member states, and the Commission actually is on the record uh, um, welcoming this. Uh, oftentimes we are very critical of this so-called gold plating, where member states go beyond what was proposed, because of course then you don't have the same level everywhere, but in this instance we've recognized very early on that in fact uh, this increases the, the amount of information sharing uh, uh, on, on cybersecurity vulnerabilities and attacks, for example, and therefore increases uh, collective security, and we are in favor of that, and I would Personally, I mean, it's speculation, but I would assume that this topic would certainly come up in case the NIS directive were to be reopened. Please introduce yourself. So my name is Thomas Walter from Easy Smart Grid. Uh, the panel just discussed that this uh, communication infrastructure is not a value in itself, but serves as the basis for uh, a lot of services. And if I understand it correctly, communication systems have been designed to transport information from A to B. Uh, but I understand that in the future, they want to be used as for automatic control, cont for, for, for automatic uh, decisions. And that uh, brings a lot of challenges. So if you're navigating your car and the communication fails, it's worse than if your communication fails when you talk to your friend because you might crash. People even talk about managing the energy grid uh, with uh, such communication. Uh, what is your opinion on uh, uh, regulatory uh, provisions to avoid uh, the use of unsuitable infrastructure for critical uh, for managing other critical infrastructures like like such as traffic or energy or others thank you so so maybe I'll sort of start because th this uh, autonomous vehicles one is 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 sort of one of my favorites and my response th well the, the response of my boss goes something like if if an autonomous vehicle crashes because it's lost connection to the 5G grid, then the manufacturer shouldn't have been allowed to make autonomous vehicles in the first place because what, what, the, what they made shouldn't have been allowed anywhere near a road and should have been horrendously illegal. So I, I, I think the extrapolated point upwards there is that um, any service that relies on a 5G, that, that makes use of a 5G infrastructure, needs to be regulatorily safe, if that's a phrase, um, agnostic of that infrastructure. You, you sort of can't assume that the infrastructure is going to be there or not. Um, it, need, it needs to be okay with or without it. I think it goes to the, to the point I made uh, before regarding that risk assessment and mitigation will become simply more complex, not just in 5G, but in a variety of, of sectors that rely um, on ICT. And as an example, if I connect my, um, my, my campus or my uh, production site to the 5G network, as a company, I think it's my responsibility to have robust risk assessment and to figure out what happens if that information network goes down? What's the fail safe? And in my opinion, the best example for this is hospitals and the energy system. In Germany, we, ha we are kind of proud that we have a highly robust energy system. But still, we require hospitals to have a, um, a diesel generator in the basement because it might go down. Like, stuff happens. <laughs> and What's the analogy for this? What's the, the um, analog 
risk mitigation strategy for the information network for the 5G grid. And this looks very different for every single industry, for every single sector. I think it's in the responsibility of that sector to figure it out um, because they want to um, they want to reap the benefits of the 5G network. So you better figure out how to do that in a responsible and sustainable way. And I think that's the policy can can nudge and and uh, give give guidance regards to what's what's a minimum requirement um, regarding um, fail safe. But I think it will be a major struggle for every sector and industry to figure that out and to to see how does a fail safe look like if the information system goes down. So I think we can uh, close here this uh, event and uh, overall I would say that uh, welcome to the complex world of competition in the security policy. We have learned that uh, competition policy is not um, our grandfather policy but it's much more complex because as a sovereignty issue a security policy. I hope that today's debate helped in framing this uh, new topic. Thank you very much.